Yo, hey guys, how are you doing? Wow, okay. It's, 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 it's all good. Hey guys, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm going to be talking about games and audio and maybe even some game audio. Uh, my name is Vincent Diamante. I am the audio director over at a company called That Game Company. Uh, not this game company, not that other game company, that game company. Uh, been there for about five years now. And I'm kind of weird because um, I have a job at a game company and I'm an audio guy. So, I mean, that is a little weird, honestly. Um, first of all, I, I kind of want to get a poll of the room. How many of you guys are audio people? Okay. So, okay, about half of you guys. How many of you guys are game audio people? Okay, same people, all right. <laughs> and the, 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 the rest of the crowd, you're just sort of like game generalist guys, you're on the periphery of games audio, you're doing like game design, game programming, game art, stuff like that? Yeah. yeah. Is that about right? Okay. Hmm. Do you like each other? They'll do. They'll do? Okay, okay, first of all, are you a game audio person? I am. You are? Okay. Uh, let me see. Clayton, is that your name? Clayton. Hey, nice to meet you. Yeah. So, um, tell me a little bit about yourself as a game audio person. Um, I, uh, I'm a published video game composer. Small stuff. Awesome. But it's, it's definitely better than... Yeah, I'd like to. Um, and uh, I, I mostly do music, uh, so it's not like directly sound, you know, I can pull out some synthesizers and maybe make some sounds with drum expertise. Uh, I have a degree in music. Uh, I've been a gamer long before I've been a musician. It has always been my first passion, even when my parents were pushing me to do the bassoon. Uh, <laughs> for which I have long given up. Uh, and, um, and I'm a game designer as well. I, I, I find both of the things just absolutely fascinating, and I know most companies are like, well, you're going to pick one or the other, which is why I look at small studios and say, no, not always. Yeah, okay. That, I, I like that attitude at the end there, especially. You know, okay, you're a, you see yourself as a music composer, sometimes some other audio, maybe, if need be, mm -hmm. but you also see yourself as a game designer. That's very cool. Who here is a game designer? You'd say you're a game designer. All right. Cool. Uh, what is your name? Justin. Justin. Tell me about yourself. Describe yourself as a game designer. As a game designer, I um, I actually prefer to focus on the gameplay elements. So what uh, kind of game feel for the most part? Okay. I, uh, I really like design mechanics that are entertaining for the player to play. It's not necessarily so much in the story way, so much as how the game plays and how it feels hmm. for me. Cool, game feel. I'm, I'm thinking about Steve Swink's book, and uh, you know, you're thinking about like millisecond level sort of stuff. Gotcha. That's cool. Um, you also identified yourself as a game designer. Yes. Daniel, yes. how do you describe yourself as a game designer? Um, I, my, my, say I, I try to be a jack of all trades kind of game designer. I try to do as much as I can as many genres, but recently I've been doing a lot of world design stuff. And that's also come into sound where it's been like, if I'm making something in the world, I oftentimes need to either work with the sound, per with the sound person or kind of find sounds myself and kind of think about how these are be implemented, like um, using some wall of sound, some ambient noise and whatnot, trying to make a world feel alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to be a game designer, isn't there? I mean, you, you've got game designers that are focused on narrative and story, game designers focused on characters. Uh, game designers that are focused on music, they, they are out there, right? Can any of you guys uh, name uh, any of them? I did Fez, um, uh, Disaster Piece. Oh yeah, Disaster Piece. Um, He's, he is a very good music composer that also does interesting interactive design stuff, yeah. Um, have you guys played Thumper recently? Yeah. That's a really interesting game, isn't it? That, um, the dude behind that, Mark Flurry, really cool guy. Not, uh, he is an ex-harmonics guy, but not really a musician, but he's very much a game designer that uses music in his design. How many of you guys have played Thumper? Thumper is a pretty cool game. What would you call the genre of that game? Um, 
Rhythm hell, I think. <laughs> rhythm hell, okay. Anyone else? Yeah. I, yeah. It's 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 such a cool game. There's so many things that go into it, and yet it's the music that really defines what that game is. It's not just a rhythm game. Actually, it's because of the sound and music choices that are done in that game that it goes from being a music rhythm game to a music hell game or a rhythm horror game, right? It sounds horrifying sometimes, and there's anticipation of getting past something or not getting past something, and it's wonderful. There aren't that many music design people out there. There really aren't. Um, you hear a lot about you know, people who are artists that are the game designer, right? You know, we, we look at games like uh, The Last Guardian, Shadow of the Colossus. That's Fumito Ueda who did that game, right? And he was an artist and an animator. And now he's a game designer, a game director over in Japan. And then you have guys that are programmers that go into games. They, Sid Meier is a programmer. And he is a designer who uses his programming capability in order to replicate these complex systems. And that, those are his game designs. But music and design, that's a tough thing. We don't really see that a lot. And I have some ideas on why that's the case. Have you guys thought about that much? Because we're mostly post. Because you're mostly post. That is actually a really good observation. There is this idea of audio and music being a post-production process, which it doesn't have to be the case, right? But you know, if that is generally accepted. It is a post-process. In film world, picture lock, then spotting session. Then you're going to be figuring out, OK, these are my cues. This is my recording. Oh, I'm watching the scene as I actually do my Foley. All right, it's post. But why doesn't it come earlier? Why can't it come earlier? I mean, many things that we uh, see as post processes in the film world, for example, VFX, visual effects, really important, incredibly important. And then you go into games, and you'll find that it is so important that they're going to have guys there conceptualizing VFX early on. They'll have concept art working alongside prototype designs and concept effects actually working alongside that. Hey, let's try to sell this design idea, not just with art, not just with interactive prototypes, but also with effects because, hey, we're pushing tech. We need to make this thing happen. We're we're projecting forward into what the next console generation cycle is going to be, bam. Audio is not part of that. You don't really think about someone conceptualizing sound design as you're thinking about what the game is going to be, or conceptualizing music as you think about what is it that the game is going to be. But why not? Has anyone ever been part of a project that was like that? Kind of? There, Tom Calarico told a story about um, them making Metroid Prime and how many of the weapons there were totally scrapped because the sound designer uh, basically said, guys, just, just listen to what we come up for gun sounds. And they, and they totally redesigned their guns based on the sound of, yeah, well, like you said, it's usually just not the case. Right. Yeah, Metroid Prime is a really interesting example. Um, that's one where the guns themselves aren't really a huge factor in the game because it's not a shooting game. Metroid Prime is a first-person adventure game, right. not a first-person shooting game. So maybe they had a little more leeway in that, and actually, I think doing it that way was right because Metroid Prime was pretty awesome. Um, oh, wow, I'm just, I'm just suddenly dating myself about how old Metroid Prime is right now. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, not a lot of games actually do that, a starting concept there. I think part of it has to do with, one, the business model. You know, we do have those accepted ideas of game audio being this post-process. And then, two, in conjunction with that, 
how are we actually going to figure out the business for that? How do we build for it? How do we contract for that? And actually, it's a lot easier if you stick with it that way, where you know at the very end, this is the game that we've got, right? Hey, we've got a shooting game, and we need these assets. Hit those assets. Fill in all the ticks on that spreadsheet, and you're good to go, right? I guess that's fun. You know, there, there is fun to be had in just the, the sheer execution and the practice of creating these audio assets, of making music. Okay, you need BGM3, I'll give you BGM3. Boom, it's there, that's part of my deliverable for this date, and then uh, you collect your paycheck and go off on your merry way. I'm actually not a big fan of that. Um, not necessarily because of the money, because actually the money's not bad once you get to a certain point. Uh, but. You know, if, if ever you can say that, yes, you are a professional game developer slash music composer, it's always a good thing. But there's something even more fun than that, which is actually being part of the game itself. And even before I came to that realization, when I was actually on the other side of this microphone here, I felt this pain of not truly being part of a game development process. Okay, I'm making music, and I'm making good music, I'm making sound, and I'm making good sound, but what does it mean to actually be a game developer that uses music and audio skills to create games? Because honestly, for as long as you work with a model that treats audio as a post-process, or one through logistics, you're going to be billing this thing that's going to have these set deliverables. You, as an audio developer, you're not making the game. You're just making those deliverables. Simple as that. Now, we could say, well, we should just scrap everything. But that's, that's everything. That's tough to do. You can't just do that. When I was a student, I decided I'm going to not do a whole lot of things that I saw at the time, back in the early 2000s, things that I still see to this day. Um, how many of you guys have been to a Game Developers Conference? Okay, a lot of you guys. How many of you guys have been to audio hangouts at Game Developers Conference? Okay. Audio hangouts are okay. They can be fun. <laughs> uh, no, I mean seriously. Okay, it's fun to do that. It's fun to talk shop. Hey, I'm doing this, you're doing that. Hey, isn't that cool? That is a fun thing to do. Uh, audio guys, if you're hanging out with a bunch of audio people, that's not all that helpful. You know, just straight off the bat, it's not all that helpful. You've got to also learn how to talk to everyone else that's out there. Uh, make friends with artists and game designers. And most of you guys are students or recently students, so that should be easy, right? They're, they're all around here. These are your friends. Well, hopefully, hopefully. This school, maybe. Okay, hopefully they are your friends. But it also works on the flip side, because you know, for as much as audio guys are struggling to find their gigs, their work, you also have game developers that are struggling to figure out how the hell am I going to utilize audio early on? You know, the flip side, that's a real concern as well. I want my audio to be the best it possibly can be. I want my music to be the best it possibly can be. But they don't realize that the processes that they use are just so utterly different. How many of you guys have been to a game jam? Okay, jamming on a game is a really interesting process because you realize that there are certain sacrifices that you do to the development process in order to make something that is at least cool. You know, you, you know what I mean, right? This is a game, 
I, I, I'm showing it here. I, I think it's a game, but hey, it's cool. This is an interesting concept, right? It's great. It's fun. <coughs> you talk to an audio designer, or you talk to a music composer, and you ask them, hey, make a piece of music. And if they are really good instrumentalists, they can basically hit record on the tape machine and create a piece of music in real time that can be considered absolutely, no question, great. Assuming you, you know, a reasonable level of skill, right? I mean, you know, Keith Jarrett's uh, the, the Cone Concert is, uh, I think it's still like the top selling jazz album of all time. And that's an improvisation that he did. Really? Hmm? Even over Keith Jarrett? Blue? Huh? Even over no, I think it might have been, yeah. I think it, yeah. Okay. So, you know, there's an interesting disconnect in what it takes to make a minimum product on both ends. Same thing on the sound design end. Okay, I'm a modular synth guy. I'm hooking up my modular synths together. I'm gonna make some really cool, awesome sounds. I've got an analog synth and I'm gonna be using an FM synth. It's gonna be awesome. Isn't this a great sound? You render it to a WAV file. It's fantastic. All right, it's ready to print. Or you're doing it fully, or you're doing some other type of sound. It's ready at that point. There's an interesting disconnect there. Then you flip over that question. Instead of making the minimum gain, which you typically do in some sort of jam format, or the minimum piece of music, you're aspiring instead for a great game, an awesome game. What about a great piece of music, an awesome piece of music? For a, a musician, what changes? Actually, not all that much, I think. You know, there might be a little bit of scale. There might be a little bit of thinking and ruminating on that idea that popped into your head a few hours ago. Is this really the idea, right idea? I'm going to maybe change a note here. Oh, maybe I can do some stuff with dynamics. But you can, you can just keep on molding and molding, and eventually you get the most perfect version of that. On the game side, there's so many different images that you can use in order to uh, represent the craziness of a game development cycle. You know, there's spirals and loops. You're going round and round in circles, instantiating a large gamut of possibilities before you find the points that actually is your game. And before you do that, you're blazing trails, you're uh, fording rivers, and then you realize, oh, in order to get the rest of the development team on there, you're going to have to pave that trail. You're going to have to create a bridge to that river. It's a significantly more difficult process. It's almost entirely different. There are people who are actually really great at working in a game jam format. Oh, you want something really quick right away? Awesome. Those guys actually are not necessarily the best game developers because game development is all about what can I do in order to not just make my stuff work, but make my stuff work with everyone else and foster that relationship so that we can work together in order to amplify each other's output into what ultimately is going to be this really, really great game. I think that's a big part of it too. It's not just the business, it's not just things like contracts and this idea of post, but the mentality of the musician and what it takes to make something that is minimum versus something that is great. The fact that it is so different from the mentality of most game developers in the iterative process of making the minimum product versus a great product. You know, that, that's really interesting, that divide there. I am a big fan of not discarding work. I hate discarding work. But I do have a lot of respect for the iterative process where you're moving through and you are willing to discard the things that you come across, the things that you make, and the things that you put love and energy into. Music composers can do that, and if they are willing to do that, then they can actually think about what was the motivation for that, 
and then move in a way that could possibly parallel the iterative process that game developers, whether they be designers, programmers, or artists, go through all the time. All right, these guys are killing their babies. Okay, well, I guess I gotta do that as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, it's, it's a, I hate that metaphor, killing babies is not cool. Um, but seriously, you know, that whole iterative process that is such a huge part of, a part of the bedrock foundation of game development is not inherently there for music composers or audio designers. So that's, that's a big first thing there. If you can actually be willing to be part of that. And yes, you can accept that it's possible to make something that is really good in five, 10 minutes, and you can't necessarily make something that is significantly better than that in another three hours, five hours, and that plateauing is going to exist there for music and sound. But it doesn't quite work that way in the game development world. That scale is different. Okay, so there's one thing. Then there's the talking part. Uh, the guys at GDC, uh, were, were you audio guys at GEC that, that went to GEC? All right. Who'd you talk to? Uh, what, what type of people did you talk to? For a while. For a while? Yeah? Uh, recently, I, was, I got to listen to a panel with um, several women on the, team, on the panel, but one of them was Mary Olson, oh. the sound designer, yeah. the sound designer for Halo. And um, I got to speak to her a little bit afterwards um, and asked her things about how to set up a uh, portfolio for sound design and things like that. Mm -hmm. right, so that was one person I, I spoke to. Also, accidentally ran into Mick Gordon on the very last oh, day. Gordon. Totally by accident. I was only there for the student day, but uh, just said hi and thank you for the amazing music he wrote. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, he's been doing some cool music lately. Yeah, definitely setting up setting up a portfolio is an interesting aspect to being a sound designer or a music composer. Uh, because ultimately, it's you know how exactly are you communicating to those prospective employers, prospective partners, as they are searching out for you know who it is that might best suit their project. I'm not a big fan of thinking about projects though. When I when I was at uh, when I was back in school, you know, projects come and go. The projects came really quickly. There, there are different people, though, that you can actually get a good sense of. Yeah, how shall I put this? How long does a project last? You know, in school, depending on, you know, what school it is, you know, if you are at a UC school, you know, they're on the quarter system, so you might have projects that are literally just a few weeks of stuff. And then what? And then you get out of school, and you'll have projects that last a few months, a few years even. And then what? You know, really connecting with a person is really important for an audio designer or a music composer. And, and I don't mean things like mentors or aspirational targets. Oh, I want to be like that audio designer. I want to be like that music composer. I mean other people. There are lots of vehicles that exist in the game industry. And some of those vehicles are actually aligned in a way that's similar to where you are and who you are and what you'd like to be. I am kind of weird, I mentioned before, because I'm not really a music composer. It's kind of funny that. I have this horrible, horrible imposter syndrome when it comes to music. Mostly because uh, I never got into music school. I actually got rejected from music school, 
uh, music composition. Um, and uh, I, I ended up getting my degree in interactive media. I'm actually, by educational uh, history and training, a game designer. But I'm a, I'm a music composer, sound designer. There were things that I wanted to do that are not my music and that are not even my game designs. What are those things? And I asked myself a lot of those questions. What is it that I want people to do? Because if you are someone that cares about contributing to the world of media, you're going to be communicating with these people and you're going to be hoping for some sort of change, a positive change maybe in the people who actually receive all of this stuff that you put out there. I was thinking to myself, as a music composer or as a game designer, I want people to actually value other people. Okay, what does that mean, to actually value other people? How can you actually do that through music? I actually didn't know at the time. I had an idea about how to do it through game design, can you make game design such that people can value other people? I think there are actually some genres of game design that can actually tap into that. For example, fighting games. Now that seems kind of weird, right? You, you have a game genre that's solely about one person beating up on another person. But I think that's actually one of those spaces that's really, really powerful because there's respect that exists between the game designer and the game system and the game player. And with that, there is respect that exists between the two players because they have resigned themselves to this system that treats them more or less equally as to how things are going to uh, actually play out in this game. Okay, I think things can be better though. You know, it's, uh, I personally would love to, if anyone wants to do this, I would love to make a video game that is a simulation of tango. You know, that, that's, I think that would be really cool because there's, there's respect that has to happen when you're in any given dance, right? If you've taken dance, you know that there's a position that you have to be in and there's a mentality that you have there. There's a relationship that exists there and you have to respect that relationship as much as the other person and then you have to lead with fortitude and you have to follow with courage. Okay. I'm answering some of those questions that I had about my own personal aspirations with regard to game design. Now, what about music? How can I make something that encourages people to respect each other through music? Well, that, that's a lot tougher. But actually, some of the things actually connected to game design. Well, I can do this with music through game design and further along that aspiration. Tango. A lot of things that people want to do in game design are not about the game projects. They're not about the individual game design components. They're about something larger. People who, who are working in games, they don't just want to work on projects. They want to work on something that's much larger than themselves. And they might not even recognize what that thing is. A project is just a project. If you are a music composer or an audio designer, one of the best ways that, hey, one of the best ways you can get a job is not to connect to the project that a game designer is offering you. Instead, connect to what it is that they either know that they want or that they think that they want to push out into the world. So I'm mostly known for working with two different companies. I'm right now with a company called That Game Company. But before that, I was working with a company called Lab Zero Games. And they make fighting games. 
They're mostly known for this game called Skullgirls. Which, on the face of it, is the most un-that-game company game you could possibly have, right? You have a game like Flower, which is a game that I worked on, which is about, oh, your, your flower petals flying through the sky, and what are the possibilities there? Or a game like Journey, which is, you know, two people that are walking through the desert in a solemn and simultaneously joyful journey towards an end. And then you have Skullgirls, which is, um, I mean, some guys are laughing because, you know, if you don't know, there's a lot of girls and titillation, and it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a funny game. <laughs> but the funny thing is, those two game designers at those two companies, that game company, Genova Chet. At Lab Zero Games, Mike Z. Those two people actually have an idea about what games are that resonates very strongly with my own ideas. I really would like it if people would be more respectful towards each other. Mike Z is thinking something very similar to that about, hey, game developers, game players. For me as a game developer, I'm going to respect you as a game player, and I think that you would love this very convoluted, very complicated fighting game system that I've set out for you to explore and master. And I'm setting it in the framework of a fighting game, which is inherently a system about respect. All right? And then you have something like Genova Chen. And Genova Chen actually looks at it a little bit differently. Is there a way that I can engender more respect, engender appreciation of all the things that are out there that can exist between two people? And he does it in a very direct way in a game like Journey. Or in a game like Flower, which was actually kind of similar to Journey in some ways, not multiplayer, not networked, but still about this space for appreciation and this wonderment at who you individually as the player are. And then from that, okay, cool. I'm a person whose design philosophy actually fits with those people's ideas and philosophies and aspirations. That's very different from being part of a project. All the guys that I know who are in-house people or who have very long-standing relationships with game designers and game directors, well, it's because they connect on that level. It's one thing to be the ideal person for a project. Oh, you want the very best John Williams score you can get without hiring John Williams? All right, I'll do that. And then what else? What, what else beyond that, right? That's it. You absolutely have to connect to game designers and game producers and writers and all those people on that level of what are their aspirations. And it's kind of funny that music and audio, sometimes those people actually have the most difficult issues with that when really music and audio can be the best at dealing with those very difficult, very complex concepts. You know, what does it mean to have a game that shows gratitude? That's actually really tough. On the other hand, the idea of a piece of music that shows gratitude, well, we can imagine that. There's actually pieces of the classical repertory that are all about that. So from that, thinking about how you can connect with other people is really important. So for audio guys, make sure that you're actually able to connect with people who are not audio people and resist the urge at places like GDC to just stand with a crowd you know, because hey, the audio crowd, it's always going to be there. You know, gang, they're a cool group of guys, they're always going to be there. You don't have to be there 
24-7. You don't always have to be there. That's not your only place for online trawling of information. Um, wow, I realized that I totally didn't even go off the slides, but yeah, what's up? Um, do you feel that the industry is project-centric in their mindset for what they're looking for? And whether that is the case or not, are you somebody who's more interested in changing their minds on that aspect, or are you just somebody who will avoid those people who are fighting? Uh, that's a really good question. I think it's actually different depending on what tier you're at. Okay. So if you are a very moneyed interest, you know, and I'm saying something like, oh, if you are a Tencent, or if you are a NetEase, if you are one of the new era of big publishers, controllers of content, you actually are looking for groups that have an ethos that is compatible with you. If you are lower than that, so if you are, oh, I am a development team, you can feel like, oh, I still have to be scrappy, right? Oh, I'm a company of five people, I still have to be scrappy. I'm a company of 50 people, well, I still have to be scrappy, right? So I am still thinking about all those projects. But it's still very worthwhile to recognize what that ethos is. And you should have a person that's there who actually harbors that ethos and that philosophy. So it could be a producer. It could be a, you know, an external producer. It could be a creative director who does that. For you as an individual, again, I think it's useful to maintain that ethos and philosophy and recognize how to connect that to other people's uh, philosophies. So, all right, there is the project. It is important to actually serve the needs of the project. But if you can connect to a creative director, this is what the company aspires for, or this is what I aspire for, and you connect with them on that level, that transcends project. That transcends project. I got lots of questions. You, you got, got lots of questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. I'm sorry that I didn't do anything with the, with the slides. I've just been sort of moving back and forth between my notes. But it's already 40 minutes in. Yeah. How deep do you think we can go with that concept of like um, connecting with the game designers and, and, designers and like achieving what they want to achieve? Like other than sound, like using sound as a these effects, sound effects, like in, in your game um, Flower, whenever the wind passes through the flower petals, it creates these like, noises. Um, mm -hmm. That really creates like an immersive experience for the player. Um, what other examples do you think we, can we come up with that? Yeah, I mean the flower thing is actually a really interesting idea uh, because that has actually no connection to game mechanics whatsoever, right? You know, those flower petals, they're on, they're off, and once you blow through them, there's no change in state after that, right? But at some point, it's not just about the game mechanics. You know, there's everything else that's on the team, right? Um, I like to think about us as individuals, when we are working on a team, that we are working as conduits of amplification, by which I mean things pass through us and then once we let them back out into the rest of the world, the team, it is somehow greater than what it was. And, and we can see that happen in lots of places, right? Oh, this animation kind of sucks, you know? But then you, you know, you do that little whoosh sound and you maybe have an impact sound there and suddenly the animation looks better, right? We, we see that all the time. Or it could be something like, and, and like a, a piece of visual art would actually have an effect on the mechanics of a game. We can, use the, uh, we can use visuals in order to say, hey, this gun is really powerful because the player isn't caring about the either hidden or seen numbers of hit points, damage that is incurred, whatever. But visuals can actually amplify the impact of those mechanics. It's the same thing there. You know, I just saw, hey, here's a place where the visuals are creating this nice background narrative. It's not part of the mechanics of this relatively simple game that Flower is, it is a very simple game, but it is part of the visual atmosphere that's there. 
and I want to be able to use a little bit of audio in order to enhance, enhance that visual atmosphere even a bit more. It's, it's really just a matter of that. If you're thinking, oh, can I take this thing that an animator has done, that a writer has done, that a game designer has done, and filter it through my level of skills in order to make it something a little bit better, then I think you're well on your way to being pretty successful. Yeah. Yeah? Um, I have a question. So you described before, I think, that um, you were someone who does sound, but then also is trained in game design formally. So that's sort of the situation I'm in. I'm someone who does sound, but um, the school I'm in doesn't really have a specific uh, or a major path for sound designers specifically. And so I was just wondering, as someone who was kind of in a situation that I think is similar to mine, what would you have done differently? Or like, what advice do you have for someone who is studying game design holistically, but knows that their passion is in sound? Mm. OK. Mm. I mean, that's a tough question. Look, mind if I drill down a little bit more into that? Sure. So uh, sound, uh, what sort of stuff do you do in the sound world? Well, this might connect to another question that I have, but basically, I, in, in my team, I do composition and also sound design. And my main area of expertise is actually in synthesizers and uh, all, all kinds of synthesis and Foley and stuff like that. All right, cool. Uh, do you, uh, are you observing any specific issues when you're working with other people? Well, um, not not specifically. I mean, I think honestly, uh, one of the things that I've uh, noticed about our team is that we communicate clearly, and um, I think the, atmos the atmosphere of, of our of um, our our sound team within the group is one that's well communicated, and that's actually something that I noticed as you were uh, as in your opening, like as you were talking about how sound is something that's almost an afterthought in the in the pipe in the production pipeline that. I, I'm very new at this. I'm, I'm only, I've only finished one game jam game mm -hmm. and then one year-long project that's still actually in the works. But I've been in the design process for both of these games, my first two games, from the start. And um, it's not startling to me that it's that sound is an afterthought in, mm -hmm. in the rest of it. But I've been able to have the opposite experience of that, where I'm actually at the start of the production as well, mm -hmm. which is unique, I guess. So this might not answer your question directly, but it does remind me of another point, um, which is recognizing your own growth curve. You know, uh, an interesting thing about when you are an audio designer or a music composer, um, let's say a publisher gives you a contract. Hey, we want this music from you. You're gonna deliver it, right? Uh, it's interesting the dates on those contracts. The date that that contract is written it is a contract with you at that particular date. It doesn't account for any growth that you are going to have. And that's kind of funny because honestly, we're people. We want to keep on growing into our roles. And we'll see that all the time in game development companies where programmers realize, oh, OK, I, I need to do x, y, and z. I'm going to be better at this particular technology. I'm going to implement this particular middleware. I am going to learn a whole lot about stuff because I'm going to be reading these white papers over the next few months and I'm going to allow that to actually inform my graphical ability as it pertains to this particular project. All right, cool. For game music and game audio, very often when you're dealing with a contract situation, it's like, well, you know, you're going to deliver this. We know what you can do. You're going to deliver that, which is okay. But it precludes this idea of you growing throughout the course of the project. You know, how do you account for that? I mean, I like to be part of a project, and at the very beginning, I'm not just instantiating who it is that I am right now, I'm also suggesting, hey, by the time this project ends, I have a feeling that I am going to be like this. I am going to do this, I'm going to do this. Uh, Five years ago, when I was just starting in-house at that game company, after contracting, you know, they finally hired me in-house as audio director. It wasn't just a matter of, oh, what are you going to do? It was, what is it that I want to do? And I'm going to learn how to play some wind instruments. 
all right, I'm, I'm an instrumentalist. I'm going to move into being a multi-wind instrument, a multi-wind instrumentalist. And so I'm okay at the clarinet and saxophone right now. And more than that, I'm starting to get really good at the iwi. E and that totally changes yeah. how I compose. And my, uh, what I proffered to the company was, you know, this is my growth curve. I am going to continue growing with you in this process. It's kind of funny because you don't really think about that too much, even as students. You know, as students, ostensibly, we're all getting better at, uh, at our uh, core competencies, right? If you're a programmer, you can assume after a year you're going to be a better programmer, right? But somehow, if you're working with a student musician who is you know, 20 years old, 22 years old, he's in college, he's still going through composition classes, you're not thinking that much about, oh, I wonder if this guy is going to be a better musician uh, at the end of the project than he is right now. I wonder how he's going to grow into this project. Does he want to get better in a specific aspect even as he works on this process? You know, so it's not just on the music composer or audio designer's end, it's also on the producer and designers to actually recognize, oh, hey, music audio guy, you're growing into this, you want to do this, you want to get better at this, I bet that we can use this idea of your growth curve as you project and actually translate that into extra growth on the part of this game that we're making. So you, you give us this conundrum through the, through the scope of the contract, which seems kind of like a strange, because people write the contract, but they're worried about the money yep. and, and, and getting the result. Yep. Um, which is almost the antithesis of, of growth development. So, so I suppose the question is, what is what is the better medium to explain this concept that you're trying to, to show us where the fruit bears from this? Yeah, is I've, it the project? Is it? Well, I mean, I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky in that the last eight years, I've never had to deal with a contract. <laughs> Whoa! Because I've been hired in-house. I've always been an in-house guy. And right at the beginning of the project, I would say, hey, um, I mean, Lab Zero, or Reverge Labs, when we were first starting working on Skullgirls, they initially hired me as, hey, you're our contract sound designer. And I laid out to them, all right, I'm a contract sound designer. You are a company of 10 people. You do contracting for all sorts of things. They contract out for art because they actually work very similar to a traditional American animation film pipeline. So they're familiar with contracting. All right, you want to contract me out? I can lay this out. This is how this contract will work. But may I suggest to you that you hire me as your first in-house sound designer, or if you want to call me audio director, that's up to you, but hire me in-house. And if you hire me in-house, I can do these things. And I was able to lay out that I can do sound design, I can do music composition, and I can also do some programming and scripting. And for them, that was enough. They were, they were very happy with what I offered them, and so they gave me a full-time offer. Follow-up question with me. You were a able to bridge the gap between me between um, your own mediums and sell it to a company, uh, and you were able to sell them a radical idea, which you know sometimes the Hans Zimmer sitting there saying, "Oh, I'm going to have ten drum sets at the same time," which you know in, 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 in audio production is like, well, "Why do we need ten drum sets?" But for for anybody who's working that isn't familiar with that, oh, ten drum sets sounds like an excellent idea. You pushed a radical idea to a company and got away with it, and good for you. How did you know that was the right time to be able to do that? I didn't. Oh. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. I mean, it's not just about me. I mean, I could tell this to all the music guys that I know and say, hey, you should do this. All the sound guys, hey, you should do this. But I'm also offering that up to everyone else that I know. And honestly, I know more game designers and game producers than I know music composers right. and sound designers. Okay. I'm basically telling them, hey, over here at that game company, 
we do something pretty cool when it comes to music and sound. And part of it is this setup. You know, I, and I'll try to poke them. You know, I, I know a guy. He could probably be a good in-house guy for you. You know, it's, you know, it's one thing to advocate just for music composers and sound designers and say, hey, you should do this. But also, on the other end, producers, publishing, designers, they should also be accepting of that idea. You know, it needs both to have a little bit of an open door before they can meet up. So I, I you know, I, I agree at what you are hinting at, that this was a really, really tough thing that happened. Um, and, and I fully admit, yes, I was definitely lucky. But I think that it results in a much better way of working. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a better way of working for um, us as audio guys because we can see how not just the project is going, but how everyone else is going. You know, we can be connected with them and their morale and their personal development, not just the development of the project. And those guys were not just another person on the other end of the email. Mm -hmm. You know, it's good for them to have that relationship. Yeah. Just have another question. So what you ended on with there, as a person being on the other end of an email, that can be really difficult to convey sort of what you talked about as far as like being on the level of the vision or the concept of the game as opposed to just the project. And so I was wondering, um, apart from you know hanging out in spheres that aren't just audio centric, like the like game, which was I went to one at the same GDC, which was pretty boring, honestly, but yeah, they're, they're Gang, Gang is cool. I mean, they're cool guys. But the thing is, they are who they are. They're an yeah. audio group. And, yeah. yeah. So I was just wondering, what ways would you recommend um, for, being, for being able to connect with people outside of your sphere who um, you want to, you're, you're trying to find this resonance in the, in the ideas that go beyond or transcend just the scope of the project? Mm -hmm. That can be a little tough. You know, it's different from person to person. Um, I, you know, this, you know, the whole gamut of what are considered interesting design challenges is huge. Uh, but you know, it helps for me that I was trained doing game design and doing programming, so I have an idea of what those issues are. But I think it's really just a matter of. Hey, what are those problems that you have? Who here would consider themselves primarily a game designer? Primarily a game designer? Uh, let's see, uh, what's your name? Justin. Justin, you're a game designer. Okay, cool. What, what do you think about when it comes to game design? Um, it's kind of a hard question to answer. I guess, I don't know if it's an answer to the bigger picture. I kind of like see all around. Uh, rather than specific things. Um, when I did game design over last summer, um, I was primarily called a quest designer, but it was under game design, and so okay. um, we worked with what already existed and created something from that. Uh, we worked with those other people, so uh, if someone from uh, storyboarding and stuff had an idea of this piece of lore needs to be turned into some quests, we would make that with that piece of uh, with that idea, or if we made something and I was like, oh, we have this idea for a quest on that because of the war, and then we worked with them, and so it was kind of like a collaborative thing. Okay, let's step, a let's step back a bit, because okay. you were talking about how you want to see beyond or see all around. Yeah. Could, you say, could you say that again? Uh, just uh, kind of like the bigger picture, but like all encompassing. Okay. So, yeah. so all, in I mean, there's a lot of ways that I can sort of map audio onto that general concept of being able to see a big picture. Um, I mean, right now, there is still the, the standard paradigm of play, regardless of what Samsung and Oculus might say, is that we have a screen, but then we also have speakers. You know, and what can we do in order to actually create feedback there? You know, meaningful feedback into game mechanics. The primary method has always been visual. You've got the screen. Uh, you know, speakers are one of those things that actually extends beyond the screen. They can make you aware of things that are not just behind the screen, but to the, uh, the sides of the screen, to behind you. Like, if I was an audio designer and I was talking to you, 
I would just be trying to push on that idea of what it means to have something that is all around. Because that is actually a, a thing that in audio I'm very familiar with. And I'm wondering if there is perhaps a tool within audio that I can use to help you. Maybe it's something where I, as an audio programmer, might go into FMOD API and say, all right, I've got these tools. You describe some of your tools to me, and I'll say, well, what if we do this? Let's do some remapping of these FMOD API functions, hook it into whatever your tools are, and see if we can do some really simple experiments on audio feedback with things that are primarily happening in the visual world and what happens when they go off the visual world. All right, and maybe that's not quite what you mean, but I think that's a space where I would want to poke you and see where that connection goes and if there is an interconnect. And maybe there's a resonance that will actually happen there. And I think that there is one. Are you given time on projects to be able to do that experimental stuff? Or are you just crunched for do the thing and you always have the next thing that you're going to do? Right. It's hard to do that unless you start early enough. Okay. You know, uh, there's a, a place for that. This is actually a place where I think contracts can actually work out because there is plenty of precedent for, well, I am going to work, say, on retainer for a period of time where the result of this period of time is going to be these experiments. You know, before you get into oh. the hard deliverables, okay. it'll be bam. And, uh, and that's actually kind of nice. And then you can use that as sort of part of your proof of what is it that you're really worth. Even as you go through the second half of the contract and any deliverables, deliverables and numbers that are already set there in stone. But um, I actually rather liked the idea, um, not the idea, I mean, I actually rather liked working on retainer for small periods of time with people that I just wanted to experiment with. And they were willing to experiment with me, with me back, at least over the course of one month, two months. And I wasn't, I wasn't required to be like, hey, here's 10 minutes of music, or here's 100 sound effects. Thank you, Mr. Neil Monte. It's three already. And um, if you're willing to stay after and answer some personal question, this room, there's no speaker after this room. But um, there's another speaker in other room you guys still want to go see, but thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Your speak was amazing. Yeah, yeah so um, I'll hang out for a while if anyone wants to just chat about stuff or come up and say, man, that's totally not how I experienced it because I totally understand it is hard to set up a situation that is different from the usual, hey, contract, cost per minute, cost per sound effect, and whatever. That's cool, but I'm here. Uh, along with what you're saying, like, I kind of like, I kind of, designer is such a broad term to me, so I've, yeah. I've like had to be yeah, able to a bunch of different situations. Um, yeah. The whole thing about uh, what you were saying, like, I think it has some of this conceptualization, like, if I have an idea, it has to do with, um, I can do this specific thing, like, this is your idea, uh, I can consult it. Yeah. 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 Ye